Yeah, well, what I find striking about the city in Europe is that it still has this quality of the public space that brings together a lot of different people, but at the same time, we can also see that it is under a lot of pressure, that there is um, multiple forces reshaping the cities uh, that we live in uh, and that show that public space is not only a matter of space, but that space, or rather that the space is not simply given or something that is simply there, it's something that has to be socially, politically produced, reproduced as well, uh, and that has certain conditions of possibility. And these are threatened, I think, by, um, you know, sometimes by the state, by securitization, by the fact that not everyone can appear in public space in the same way that certain people, homeless people, refugees, uh, um, people of different kinds that are not fitting the image of the public space that the city wants to project, that they are marginalized or excluded. Um, it's also under pressure, I think, from economic forces of you know, gentrification, the fact that the city has become almost unaffordable for some. Uh, in Berlin, you know, I guess like in Barcelona for some time, the rents have been going up. Uh, it's very difficult apparently to control that politically, legally, it's very contested. There have been uh, big movements in Berlin as well about the right to the city. Uh, people have followed the example of Barcelona very closely. What can you do to counter these tendencies? Um, and um, well, that's I think something that also on a global scale we can see and we can see that it's more advanced in some places like the US maybe where access to public space and also the infrastructures that support public space, public transport, health institutions, educational institutions, is already structured in a much more exclusive way, whereas in many European countries, at least, it's comparatively open. I mean, there are, there are the exclusions and marginalizations that we talked about just now, but uh, it's comparatively more open. Um, and I think we also learned during the pandemic that these infrastructures are of such vital importance. They are invisible often because we take them for granted, but we saw that they are extremely important for social life in the city to continue even under the conditions of the pandemic, under the conditions of climate change, uh, and that they have to be made inclusive, that if they are structured in this exclusive way, this will undermine the possibility of public space for everyone in the end. I think on the one hand, cities uh, can be symbolic, right? I mean, they stand for something that um, is under attack. Um, uh, they are often, of course, also the center of cultural, economic, political life in a country. So they are, in that sense, um, targets, I assume. Uh, but I guess they also, um, in many cases at least, Sarajevo would be an example, Mariupol is also an example of that. They have a history and present that um, exemplifies a kind of diversity and of living together in diversity that is a threat to the authoritarianism, to the nationalism, to the fascism maybe that attacks it, right? It's a counter model. It's something that in a way can't be tolerated because it puts into question the fantasy of purity and homogeneity that the nationalist or imperial project um, perpetrates. And, and puts forth. Uh, so I guess my speculation would be that uh, the violence directed at cities that have um, in a way symbolized this kind of everyday multiculturalism, so not as an ideal but just as a lived reality where people of different ethnic, religious, etc. backgrounds live together, have lived together for you know, decades or centuries, that this is something that seems to provoke the aggression, the violence of this nationalist imperial projects, and that's why they become targets. The city has the big advantage, I think, in comparison to the state, for example, that it is always already diverse. It's always already confronted with the reality of migration, of people coming from many different places to live there together. The city doesn't have to regulate access. It's already <laughs> you know, beyond that, in a way. 
Um, so in a way, the city is um, always already much more diverse than the state maybe imagines it to be. And I think this actual reality of diversity in the city should be seen much more as a, as a resource than as a threat or as a limitation or a challenge, which it is often framed as, you know, as, well, it's completely fragmented. We have all these different communities, uh, but the reality is that they live together and that um, this living together, of course, produces conflicts and tensions, etc. but it's never as, um, um, you know, antagonistic as uh, the kind of right-wing discourse against migration or against multiculturalism tries to present it as. I think we have to come to see this as the normality, for better or worse, you know, I mean, migration and unfortunately also refugee movement is um, going to be part of our future for a whole variety of reasons. People have always been moving, but there's also climate catastrophe, there's economic turmoil, there's wars, etc. Wars that are also not happening out of the blue, but where, you know, many European or Western states have had some role in. So I think it's also the responsibility of European states and cities to see how um, this can be made into a livable solution where migration becomes a normality. A normality it already is in a way, right? But it has to be recognized as such. Protest and uh, visible resistance has a lot of preconditions that if there is no public space or if public space is so tightly controlled by the state, by the police, that it's very unlikely that people will find the access to it, um, that then there's nothing will happen, or little, very little will happen. I mean, the case of the anti-war movement in Russia is interesting because on the one hand it is a very small movement in terms of numbers, but that the state is so afraid of it that even people who hold up a white paper are arrested. Just like in Turkey, people who were just standing on the street were arrested because in the context of Gezi that was already seen as an act of protest. It also shows that there must be a certain level at which the state is afraid of this, that um, this already shows uh, something, this protest, right? That the um, act of dissent shows that there is at least part of the population who does not agree. Um, so I think in that sense, despite the small numbers, it is very significant that there is this um, anti-war protest in, in Russia. It sends an important signal, but it shows that uh, protest, dissent, opposition is very fragile, that it depends on these infrastructures, the infrastructures that allow people to protest, <laughs> to make uh, certain claims in public. Um, but it's also important that this infrastructure is not only threatened in like openly authoritarian states like um, Russia today, uh, but also for many people in you know, so-called liberal democracies in the West, it is also uh, threatened. I mean, if you are an undocumented migrant or refugee and uh, you participate in political protest, you put yourself at risk in a way that is not really imaginable for, for citizens who don't have to fear you know, being deported. Um, so yeah, I think this is a gradual and very complex uh, relation that we see here between um, access to public space, uh, political status, um, and the ability to speak out in public, uh, right? When in Paris, uh, a bit more than a year ago, I think, there was a protest by refugees who put up tents symbolically on the Place de la République, and immediately the police very violently uh, destroyed the camp. It was clear that this was just a symbolic act. They didn't plan to stay there. You know, it was just, we are here. Please, can you somehow recognize our presence and try to come up with a solution because we are sleeping under the bridge. It's not viable, right? Um, but the police reacted so violently that the mere presence of these refugees in the public was such a powerful provocation of the state or of the status quo that it reacted in this very violent way, just like the Russian police react so violently to someone ho holding up a blank sign. So this should make us think about, you know, what are the dynamics that structure access to public space? What are the dynamics that 
allow people to act politically or not? And you know, how do we perceive what is happening there? In Berlin, uh, there is um, a very interesting place in Lichtenberg, in the eastern part of the city, which is called uh, Dongswan Market. Uh, it's a, so the Dongswan Market is a famous market in Hanoi, in Vietnam. And uh, in Berlin, this is a big complex of um, huge warehouses in which you have a lot of um, uh, su like Asian supermarkets for food, but also restaurants and uh, little shops run by Pakistani, Afghani migrants, by people from Vietnam, from many different places all over uh, the world. And it's a kind of um, very different urban space and public sphere from what you would find in Berlin Mitte or in you know, the more posh parts of the city. Uh, but I love it a lot because it's, it's extremely diverse and all these people from extremely different backgrounds get along in a very pragmatic kind of everyday uh, um, way. Um, you also have people from you know, the Eastern German province who come there uh, to shop because it's cheap, to eat food because it's you know, sort of interesting for them. Although in a kind of stereotypical way, they might seem like you know, Eastern Germans who might have some right-wing political, may, and maybe they do, maybe they do. But you know, still in this place, these people somehow come together, interact. For me, it's personally interesting because um, of uh, our family situation where you know, we have Polish, Vietnamese, Turkish, and German uh, um, links. And uh, yeah, it's just a very nice place where this, in a normal way, is somehow uh, practiced, you know, this, this, this cultural uh, mix with the help of food. It's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting uh, experience.